And we're here. We're live. We're live. We're live. Hey, everybody. Rachel B. Lee. And Joshua B. Lee. And Cranky B. Lee. <laughs> He's asleep. And Zachary B. Lee. No. <laughs> He's waiting for Zach to start dropping bombs before he wakes up for the conversation. <laughs> people want to, people like to be leaving Zach, you know? So we just, it's catchy. Like it's very catchy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you got today. Me. Count count me in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Well, hey, we see so many of our family members here. You know, shout out to I see Brian Johnson. We see Tracy. Steve Jordan. Steve Jordan. Yeah. Um, Teresa TC. Les is on. Amazing. Amazing. Get that chat going. Okay. We love seeing the chat. Let us know where you are listening in. From love the hair, Jorge. We know so many of y'all, but Zach doesn't. So, Zach like doesn't... I said, please like make sure you know tell them where you guys are at, where you guys are coming from. You know, yeah. You know, we're gonna get into an amazing conversation today. Um, you know, I feel pretty honored and blessed to be able to have you know Zach here with us. And I mean, being able on the platform that we're using, we got one of the VPs of Blue Jeans by Verizon joining us. So like we really get to kind of dive in a little bit deeper and, and really see exactly not only. How this platform works, but how a company like you know Verizon, Blue Jeans by Verizon, is actually you know inspiring our workplace and being able to make these changes and shifts with everything that's going on today. That's right. So we know that there's this like first things first. Zach, we want you to introduce yourself. Everyone, keep the keep letting us know where you're in from: Australia, Oregon, Florida, the UK. Thank you so much for being here, um, Zach. We would love it. We're gonna also just get a little poll going while you're listening. Let us know if this is your first Janet Authority event. Tell us a little bit about your background, your journey sure. to now being the VP of you know product and growth at Blue Jeans by Verizon. Yeah, that's great. Thank you uh, for having me, Josh and Rachel. I'm so excited to be here, and thank you all for joining uh, today. So I, uh, as you said, I am the uh, Vice President of Product and Growth Marketing at Blue Jeans by Verizon. Um, I have been with Blue Jeans for about four and a half years, and before that, I was in other product marketing roles uh, at technology companies like Symantec and Veritas. So uh, I've been in the technology space for about 15 years, um, primarily doing product marketing. But here at Blue Jeans, my role has expanded out a little bit more. Uh, so my day-to-day -day responsibilities, you know, first and foremost, I am responsible, and my team's responsible for crafting the messaging and the positioning and kind of defining the value proposition for all the different products in our portfolio. Uh, second of all, I'm responsible for customer marketing. So that's really understanding how our products and solutions are impacting our customers, creating value, capturing those success stories, and being able to share that with the world and, and demonstrate that advocacy. Um, another side of the business that I'm responsible for is more of the website, our e-commerce, uh, our digital footprint. Uh, so I spend a lot of my time thinking about that customer journey as folks come to our website. Are they able to access our trial experience? Are they able to get the content they need to learn more about our products and solutions? Uh, and of course, populating all the content that sits there. So a bunch of different things. Every day is different, uh, but every day is exciting. And I've loved it for four and a half years. It's been an incredible journey, uh, both before Blue Jeans was acquired by Verizon, uh, going through that process, and now kind of where we sit today uh, amidst the, the broader company. Love it. It's awesome. I mean, I have like so many questions just on your day to day job and many of the people I can I know in this crew are also marketers. And so you might see some questions come in just from like, you know, con customer experience and website building. Um, I mean, I'm surprised too. I mean, like, like we got the the man, like they, they, the guy you know, thinking about it. Going through all the things. I mean, like you guys, any any questions, any comments you have about get him in here. The experience, like you're getting direct access into the guy that. That has his hand on the pulse, right? Like, so this is this is awesome too. I mean, yeah. So many different businesses, Zach. I mean, like you, just like us. You know, we're consumers in this world, in this digital space, yeah. and it's hard to be able to actually get in touch or connect with the the sources and people that you're you're trying to be the the applications, the people that are in charge of having to run these things. So, yeah. You know, it, it's awesome. we're, we're out here. I, I promise, we're out here. You know? We're real people humans. Do. You know, yeah, people. Do. We're not machines. We're not machines. It's so much of what you know, Josh and I are value proposition here at Standout is like every company is run by another human being. You know, real humans do this stuff. Yeah. Zach, one of the first things that I know we're really curious about um, is, you know, being at Blue Jeans, then getting acquired. So what was that like? And then pre-COVID, 
and to post-COVID world. So kind of a two-part question. Back it up. Yeah, Back it up. right beginning. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it feels like I've worked at many different companies, yet you know, it's, it's all kind of been the same, uh, the same organization that I've supported. Um, coming into BlueJeans in 2018, you know, my belief was that video conferencing was on the cusp of taking off. You know, people had used Skype. Uh, they weren't totally satisfied with it. WebEx had been out there for a long time. Uh, Zoom existed, but more in kind of like small businesses were aware of it. And so there really was this great opportunity for video conferencing to be more of a critical communication tool in medium sized and large enterprise uh, type organizations as workforces were becoming more dispersed. And so I was coming into blue jeans thinking like, man, I am on the cusp of a technology space that is about to take off. And I can't wait uh, to be a part of that journey. And so it was going really well. You know, we were competing with Zoom. Uh, they were kind of attacking the lower end of the market and going up. We had more of the enterprise space and coming down. And then in March 2020, obviously things began to change a little bit. And like most of the other video conferencing providers, we saw our service adoption just go like this. Uh, it was like the typical hockey stick chart that you see in a textbook. Uh, and obviously there was something happening uh, first in kind of the Asia Pacific region. And then obviously as COVID became more of a global uh, concern, we saw what would happen in terms of everyone kind of moving and working from home. And it was at that point in time, March, April, May of 2020, that we were in conversations with Verizon to be acquired. So it was almost a simultaneous uh, point of acquisition where as growth was skyrocketing, as video conferencing was becoming maybe the most important tool for our day-to-day -day communications from a, a business standpoint, we were then acquired by Verizon. And, you know, so it was like, if, the first thing I'd say is that we were really struggling to convince people to turn on their video cameras. You know, people didn't want to show their face. That was like the big challenge we were combating out of the gate up until like March 17th, 2020. And then on like March 20th, 2020, it was like, you know, the, the windows had opened and people's faces were there and we were, we were facing a different challenge, right? Which is that everyone wanted fun, new, cool features. And so we were in a different stage of adoption at that part of it. And not only were we working as blue jeans to satisfy our customers, we also had this new massive Fortune 15 company uh, to help, uh, help us achieve scale, but also we were enabling Verizon to use our products and services. Um, and so fast forward to today, kind of a very different experience. We went from a 500 person company that was super scrappy, trying to do everything, you know, to just grow uh, to the point of acquisition during this stage of tremendous adoption of video conferencing to today, where now we're fully integrated within the broader Verizon machine, still have a lot to learn there, still have a super scrappy team. But we've got better connective tissue to the, the broader Verizon organization to help us grow. But everyone knows video conferencing. But there are video applications like virtual events, like the thing we're doing today, that still aren't as well understood. And so now kind of day to day collaboration, I think people at least understand how they can have effective meetings. And certainly there's room to grow there. But we're doing a lot more education around some of these other topics to help organizations communicate more effectively and to help, you know, customers get the word out. Uh, from, from more of a marketing perspective in terms of how they can use this technology to help grow their own businesses. So, you know, it's been this epic experience where the market has dramatically gone through this life cycle and we've been in different stages of growth and kind of uh, the life cycle curve ourselves as a business. So super kind of long winded journey, but it's given me personally the opportunity to experience all these different stages uh, all in a four and a half year period. And of course, the pandemic was a part of that. Uh, and it's kind of you know weird to be at a company whose growth was fueled by the pandemic when everyone you know is super concerned about like what is going on out there. So a lot, a lot to uh, kind of work through, but certainly a tremendous amount of experiences. Yeah, as he was talking, I was like, so when I was at Microsoft, like, oh my, the same story was popping in my head as I'm going through, here, and I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna say it. Because I remember when, because I, you know, Zach, I've, and everyone here, like, I've wait, been, are you really going to tell a Microsoft story? Well, I was going to say, like, <laughs> you know, 20, I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. So, like, I've been on camera when Skype, and which is crazy again, I'm like, God, he uses Skype. He just said, he just said Skype. But, you know, like, that's how we all started going through that. So, I was very comfortable going into the pandemic, being on camera. And I remember when Rachel had started working at home, and she'd be like, okay, no one can make a sound. But we can't have any kids walking behind us. And I'm like, dude, it's real life. Like, it's okay. 
Well, before and before that, not the story that that was not, but that's the good one. I like your perspective of it. But before that, like people did not turn their videos on, Zach. Right. Like that really resonated with me, and I was the remote worker. That wasn't common in 2017. Like I had negotiated to be with this beautiful man and two children, um, and so like it was so hard to be a remote worker and then my my boss wanted to talk on the cell or mm -hmm. video off when you're trying to really stay visible um mm -hmm. and i think that's like a a, a great question and kind of segue because what we do want to talk about today also is just like workplace culture and how do we continue to inspire you know so talk about this transition that you've experienced with mm -hmm. your team, mm -hmm. you know, as you guys have moved to fully remote workplace, right? Yeah, it's it's you know another interesting element of the blue jeans to Verizon transition is that as blue jeans, so so I live in Oakland, California. We have offices in uh, San Jose, offices in San Francisco, and so I would go. This is 2018, 2019. I was going into our San Francisco blue jeans location for probably five days a week. And we were a video conferencing company and we were very cool with people, you know, taking work, work from home days. We did have some. Uh, I lost sound for a second. Zach, can you hear us? Muted. muted. All right. Somehow the entire thing muted. <laughs> Can everyone hear us or just not Zach? No, no audio, audio at all. At all. No at all. Oh, I hear Zach. Okay. okay. Well. Now I can hear you. There is a little delay right. too. We back on? Okay. <laughs> Back. It was We're funny. Back. I was moving the screen a little bit so it was close to the camera, and all of a sudden the sound went off. I'm like, I didn't touch the sound. I'm like, I don't know what I did. Yeah, back. something. My, my browser got hidden too. So I uh, okay. We're back. I was telling a story about how we went from a team that was primarily based in the Bay Area, with a handful of individuals spread throughout the globe, to a team that is fully remote, and. Mm -hmm. It and it's just been a really challenging transition. I'm not. I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, as a manager, uh, someone who who tries to bring their team together, uh, you know, frequently, there's definitely um, difficulties when it comes to coaching and mentorship. You know, I think you can get a lot done over a video conference. You know, I'm a huge fan of online meetings, right? But I. Zach, we're losing again. you again. And I wonder if it's maybe AirPods, maybe you just, I don't know. Sometimes my AirPods go in and out. AirPods can be tricky. Let's go with this. Then. Maybe yeah. this will be better. Yeah. yeah, sometimes that happens to me with the AirPods. We've had the AirPod issue too. Okay, so that. now we need to now have a conversation with Apple. Get them on <laughs> you know, as I was telling Joshua and Rachel earlier, I'm in this co-working space today. Things are a little askew. That's how it goes. <laughs> we're in it. We're in it. This is live. This is the beauty of live, right, Zach? Yeah, you got to go live. Um, so, so I'll wind this up. <laughs> we so, talk about the coaching and mentorship, right? Yeah. Your... So, you know, you can have a team meeting. You can have one-on-ones, but not necessarily being able to sit by someone side by side and have those conversations throughout the day. Did they just pop up, right? Like, hey, what about this thing? Or, hey, would you quickly take a look over my shoulder on this thing? Or, hey, I've got this question. And what's happened, at least in my experience, and I think this is kind of pervasive, is that to answer the simplest question, people will schedule 30 minutes on your calendar. And so we've gone from a world where I feel that, you know, you're all together collectively and you have the ability to help the team grow throughout the day to a booked calendar where now you're struggling just to make it throughout, you know, a day of back-to-back -back meetings. And so I think those are some of the challenges that we have to navigate. And I think we've got the technology and tools to be able to do that. 
but I think it has been a bit of a transformation. And I think it's an area where managers in particular will struggle if they don't kind of fully use all the tools at their disposal. Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree. Because I mean, it's that point and, you know, you can't inspire the workplace, you're everyone around, if you're not actually embracing those aspects that you're asking them to be able to embrace, right? Like if you're gonna be, you know, a manager or a vice president like that, and you're not gonna get on camera, you're not gonna use the different tools, you're not gonna be able to go through to be able to have these open conversations, how can you expect the rest of the workforce to be able to kind of go through and go, yeah, cool, I'm in, you know, and they're gonna have that disconnect as well too. And so I appreciate that, that, that you, you put that mentorship in, you know, and leveraging the different aspects that are in the tools that we have available. Cause I mean, like, fuck, I mean, we all know like we have more tools than ever before to be more connected before, even though we're farther apart. And it's yeah. still a shift because like you said, we're, a lot of us are used to just walking into another room, right? And like, Hey, Zach, a quick question for you right quick. And then you move on. But now it's the whole, do I need to take 30 minutes on a schedule? Do I need to be able to do, is it 15? What's the best, best way to be able to do that and be able to have those conversations? Yeah, and I think that because this period, especially the past two, not three years, we've seen so much turnover in a lot of our organizations. You know, everyone has new hires, you know, it's, at some point, and you're, like, I've, it's unbelievable to me how many new hires I've brought onto the team that have since left the team that never met anyone face to like face to face, wow. right? So you have to come up with an onboarding strategy and an approach that not only helps these individuals create foster relationships amongst themselves, but also build the right approach and the right development plan that'll get them, you know, on board and up and running as quickly as you possibly can in a fully virtual format. And so there are a ton of tools out there. And I think one of the big challenges actually is trying not to overdo it because there's so many SaaS products. You can <laughs> go crazy with all these products out there. But um, I think if you can find the right kit, the right set of tools for, for your team and your organization, you do have the opportunity to, to transform your organization from a productivity standpoint point and be successful in a hybrid environment. But I, I do also believe that teams need to get together periodically. I don't, I think it's really challenging to be 100% remote all the time. Um, and so I think that's also part of weaving into your communication strategy is we're going to be remote, 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 and then maybe we're going to do a face-to-face. -face. And then we're going to figure out, and you got to give everyone plenty of time to plan. That's the other thing. Because everyone's everywhere, schedules are crazy. And so it's just being considerate. At the end of the day, I think you have to be considerate of everyone's situation but really kind of pragmatic about how you can bring everyone together. Yeah, I've seen um, other organizations meeting on like a quarterly basis with their teams at a central location. Um, is that something that you guys are starting to do or at least half twice a year or something like that? Yeah, yeah so as the marketing organization, we're trying to get together quarterly uh, and it's really helped with our planning efforts. And one of the great benefits of Verizon is they have offices everywhere. <laughs> yeah. You want to meet in Dallas because it's a central place? Great. You want to go to Miami because it's going to be nice? Cool. Let's do that. New Jersey is where the headquarters is. Yeah, let's pop over there. Offices in California make it easy for us. So we're, we're truly blessed in the fact that they do have a, a wide amount of places for us to come together as a team. And not everyone's always traveling across the country, um, which is beneficial. And then as a, as a leadership team, we're doing something very similar. Um, maybe not quarterly, but every six months we're trying to get together and kind of reset and align and just make sure we have the opportunity. Because like I said, we have had this influx of new talent and you get to a point when you're bringing in onboarding new team members where if you don't do a sufficient job of getting everyone to know each other and work together beyond just like these super tactical meetings, yeah. what happens is these silos, which I'm sure everyone's kind of experienced in, in medium sized and large companies. And so you have you know, the engineering team doing one thing, you have the product team doing another thing, the marketing team doing one thing, sales team running in their one direction. So everyone's running in different directions and you lose yeah. that cohesion and that really tight knit kind of strategy and alignment and like, yeah. you know, uh, just the everyone, the, the culture effectively that we had as a 500 person company where everyone was kind of working out of a handful of offices. So I think those are, those are some of the big ticket items that if you can figure out how to navigate the physical remote divide and, and bring it together in a way that, that brings folks together, then at least you're gonna do some of that silo busting. And that's something we're working at, right? It's something that I've, I've observed and I think you know, as, as a leader, something that you have to be mindful of and like, how can we insert ourselves uh, across the organization to help just bring everyone together? You know, that's one of the key jobs, I think. Yeah. That culture, creating culture when you're not 
physically with people is yeah. a new norm. Like, I don't, I think we're still just so learning how to do this. It's almost like you we, with our team. Yeah, yeah, I mean, with us too, it's like we know how to do culture online, kind of. I'm going to say kind of because we're a little bit rude. Some people do and some people don't. And like we have like the gaming community, right? Like we have metaverse. It's like we kind of have like that not figured out, but like there's like a almost like culture of it in some sense. But the hybrid and like workforce aspect of being remote, we have not figured that out quite yet, which I think is cool because this is just a real opportunity for new creation. Mm -hmm. And to and another thing I think that's really interesting, and then I, I I'd love to hear your take on this, and I want you to answer Lauren's question next. In 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 as uh, so if he wants to hear about the um, why don't we answer his question? And I have a question around the generational differences mm -hmm. inside. So Lauren Lauren yeah. says, what onboarding process have you found that works and doesn't work? And that's a great question. I, I know what doesn't work. What doesn't work is letting the new hire figure it out and, and like basically come on board. Sink or swim method? I mean, that's what I was taught. Sink or swim. I know, I'm like, I've done, yeah, that was my way. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of sending someone off on sink or swim, and it's ineffective. I think what has worked for me is, you know, first of all, I give a very lenient kind of 90 day onboarding period. I, I expect uh, that when I'm hiring folks, that they will not have industry expertise. And if they've done product marketing at other organizations, it might be different than the way we do it at BlueJeans. So I think you have to kind of uh, enable them to come up the curve on the market, the value proposition, competitive dynamics, and that in and of itself is a meaty set of learning. And then simultaneously, there are certain things about our day-to-day -day jobs that maybe someone didn't do at their previous organization they have to learn that as well. So that first 90 days is, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to stuff a bunch of projects on someone's plate. I'm trying to get them to understand the operation, operating model that we have in place that has made us successful over the past couple of years. But I'm also trying to serve as a network liaison. So, you know, week one, here are all the marketing folks on the team. Here's the org chart. Let's set up one-on-one -on -one meetings with each of these different stakeholders. Great, week two, let's start to introduce you to some of the folks in the product organization so you can build those relationships. Great, week three, I'm gonna introduce you to some of the sales reps and the, the sales engineers so you can start to build relationships there. And then week four, let's talk to some of the customer success managers. And so you're going through that process and you're starting to connect the dots. Oh yeah, I heard that over here and I heard this over here. And hopefully by the end of that first month, you've at least built a network or, or that, uh, that new hire has built a network of individuals that can serve as the support system. Right? And so simultaneously, you're getting the support system in place while you're getting the functional and technical knowledge to do the job. And so it's like, great, by day 45, I'll assign you a project. And yeah. you know, I think there's this urgency probably at very senior levels of organizations where it's like, I just brought on this great candidate, they're gonna come in and crush it on day zero. And like maybe, maybe you'll find that rock star. I've had maybe one of those people in all the folks I've hired. Um, more likely than not, you need to take a very proactive but also lenient posture towards bringing folks up to speed. And, you know, organizations of all different sizes, there's going to be different tolerance for that. And sometimes, you know, the answer is like, when was this project due yesterday? Okay, well, maybe that's not the right mentality. Um, because if you really want people to be successful and create sustainable, you know, experience, I won't say careers because careers kind of an outdated concept. But if you want them to have a sustainable experience at your company, then I feel like the right onboarding where they get that network and they get the right domain knowledge to do their job is critical. If you don't do that, I think you're signing yourself up for future issues where you're like, oh, crud, they don't know who that person is? Man, that's, that's my bad as the manager. You know, I love how you put that because it, it really resonates. I mean, a lot at Standard Authority, we talk about understanding the human algorithm, right? Because especially on social and things like that, people try and be able to go in in the same way that you would you know, your onboarding is the same way we talk about, you know, don't just go in and connect with someone on LinkedIn and, and pitch them immediately, right? It's, it's, it's jarring. You're like, ooh, you know, I don't want that. You've got to be able to have a conversation that builds a relationship and the relationships create opportunity. And so I want everyone to be able to pay attention to this. Like, we're not talking about rocket science here. We're just talking about understanding how humans work, the condition of being online in person, being able to bring them on into a company is the same thing I'm trying to bring a client on, right? Or being able to do a sale. No one wants that immediate, like, here's everything, throw it at them and hope that one rock star, like you said, Zach, 
you know, jumps out. And that's what usually happens, you know, when you're doing sales. And it correlates so well when you're just talking about bringing people on boarding your company at the same time. And I want people to pay attention to that because yeah. these things flow, right? And it's just. Yeah, I mean, it's about the relationship. I think, I think it's a great, like, com kind of um, comparison. comparison. I'm trying to think of a better word for it, but that was. And I really appreciate, Zach, in the onboarding process that you have because um, I've been on both. I've experienced situations where I've come into a company and the manager has not made a roadmap for me and has not set up those conversations with the team that first month. And it, it is, it's a little bit more challenging, right? It's a lot different when Zach introduces Rachel as so-and-so wants you to talk versus Rachel's the newbie and has to go talk to Zach, the VP, you know? And I really love that piece of helping people build the relationship and sort of those warm introductions. I think that's such a great piece of advice that is so easy. I think that's easy to set up when people onboard. Like it's like first thing. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, you want to? Yeah, we got another go. great question. We have another great question. So we're. This is what it's all about having that conversation. I mean, like, it's not just Elizabeth, lead, leading this. So, yeah. I mean, what like, are the best experiences and outcomes you've had doing onboarding? You know, I think the best experiences, the best experiences for me, I think there's, I mean, I, I haven't really thought about this, but when I know that we're doing a, a good job, is when the, the new hires, are able 45 days in, 60 days in, to identify projects and say, oh, there's an opportunity. Like, I know where we are in terms of everything that's happening, and I see a gap. And I can independently identify that this is something that maybe I'm not ready to take it on, but at least I can identify that there's a need here and something that we need to tackle, and I can, I can bring that back. Uh, and I'll talk to Zach about that, right? I'll, I'll talk to whomever on the management team that there's something um, that we need to do. And so I think it's like that pivot from being reactive to proactive. And when someone starts to demonstrate that they can spot things, it's like, great, they're getting their muscle memory up to speed, right? They yeah. figured out where kind of the puck is going and they can start to skate there. And so I think that is a really critical indicator that someone is getting it and they're moving forward. Um, I think the other really telling signal is when you're in a, you know, a lot of times as, as someone's manager, or part of the leadership team, you're, you're going to sit in some meetings early on just to make sure that there's like this game of telephone doesn't happen, right? Like you want the right information to be processed. But when you sit in a meeting and the person that you brought on board leads the meeting and, and in your head as the manager, you're like, well, this is the last time I'm coming to this meeting. <laughs> you know, it, it, because that's great, right? You, you've enabled that person and empowered them to be self-sufficient. What greater gift is there in, in, in terms of their ability to then go and beat to their own drum and, and get the job done in the way that they want to go do it? And for you as the manager to be like, great, now I've, I've enabled kind of like this delegation mechanism where I've taken something and provided it to someone else. And then I freed up my time to go work on the gazillion other things that I don't have time for. And so I think it's like those are really strong signals that you're doing it right. And I think you know, you get to the two month marker, you get to the nine day marker, it's still maybe a development area and opportunity, great. You're not going to hit on every hire either. I mean, that's like one of the dirty secrets, right? It's like you hope you do. You hope that yeah. your vetting process and your interview process is like rock solid. But it's, I mean, come on, that's it's, it's real. You're not everyone's going to, for whatever reason, like not everyone's going to be a perfect fit for the job. And I think you have to understand that too. And then there's this other really interesting thing, which is tough in a virtual uh, kind of you know dynamic with a remote workforce is how do you then help that person find out what they're really good at and reposition them and do other things when you're not mm. with them day in and day out. That's where it kind of ties back to some of the mentorship and coaching challenges. It's like, if they're, if they're hitting all these markers and they're out there and they're crushing it, awesome. You can, virtually, you're good to go. When they're struggling, that's when you need to invest in perhaps a more regular cadence of meetings that are focused not just on tactical projects, but kind of more big picture items. And one of the things that we use at BlueJeans, and I know a lot of people use different tools with Slack, I think asynchronous communications, chat, is a really powerful tool versus email. I know there's yeah. still a lot of folks out there that are dependent on email. I would encourage everyone to get yeah. into more of a work stream collaboration type threaded chat experience because that's where work happens. You know, yeah. it, that's what gets you out of back-to-back -back meetings and out of reading ridiculously long emails that are impossible to penetrate. 
Um, so and out of being in the conversation with your team and, and the tactics mm -hmm. and instead having a conversation around how are things going? What is challenging you? How, how are you like, where do you want to go from here? Mm -hmm. And I feel like Zach, because, you know, I want to continue. There's another piece I think that we need to address in this conversation and keep those questions coming, y'all. We love seeing these questions. We're looking at them. Is this idea that like we are starting to run up against a tougher economy? There are layoffs happening. Um, and we're still adjusting to this new workplace environment while the economy adjusts. In addition to the fact, I'm going to layer this in for you, Zach. We have multiple, this is the most amount of generations we've ever had in the workforce at one time, five generations. So there's a lot of different <clears throat> needs and yeah. wants, like Gen Z is very different millennials and very different than Gen X, than boomers, right? So like, how are you approaching, um, I think a as the storm hits, like how do you keep your team motivated? And then the second part of that is like, in your experience working across different generations, because I'm sure you are, like how are you managing through that? Yeah, so uh, it's a lot. I know. <laughs> Handle it all in two Rachel, minutes. We, we promise we just lob them some softballs. <laughs> and then be able to go we ahead. did. We talked onboarding. That was easy. Yeah. Uh, so I think that um, you know one of the things that we're preaching um, at the Verizon, like corporate CEO level, all the way to the Blue Jeans level, is focus. Right. We we have a tendency to take on a little bit more than we can chew. Oh, like that might be a growth opportunity. Let's go do it. Oh, that might be a growth opportunity. Let's go do it. Oh, what about these other 100 things? Let's go do all of them. And it's like, well, that's going to lead to burnout. And that's going to learn lead, lead to attrition. That's going to lead to us not achieving any of these goals. And so the, one of the most challenging, I know I've said this a couple of times, like another really challenging thing about today's economy and kind of what businesses are being asked to do is focus. Right, because whoever the stakeholders are, they always want you to do more. And it takes so much discipline and rigor to say no. They remember, we said that we were gonna focus on these three KPIs and those things have specific tactics associated with them. We're not gonna go do all the other stuff because we said that's not what was important. But then it's, it's a constant conversation. And then so for the team, that's, so that's kind of like mid-level management up trying to remind the you know, senior executive team Hold on, guys. Like you keep asking for more, but we need to have a what's what's not what are we not going to do, right? And and so I think that's a game of tug of war. When it comes to you know trying to engage the team in a, in a difficult economic climate, it's again about focus, right? It's about saying, hey, we we have a strong belief as to where we think we can win, right? And we think that these sets of projects are where we can win. Budgets have been cut. You know, our budget was cut substantially from a marketing perspective. So it's like, great, what are we not going to do? What are we going to do? Which personas are we going to focus on? How are we going to get there? What's the most scalable and efficient economic way for us to do that? And let's get those programs in motion. So if we're going to win, we're going to win fast. If we're going to fail, we're going to fail fast. And we can make better decisions going forward. But when projects keep coming in and there's scope creep, we have to be diligent about raising the red flag and saying, remember, we weren't going to do this little side project because it's going to take a month and it's going to challenge us to do other things. So I'd say focus is the key. It's not easy. And it requires that dialogue up the ladder as well as down the ladder. On the, um, the generational question, I have, I, my, one of my favorite things about having a team, especially over the past like decade, is that it's multi-generational. Because you do have um, kind of the older generations that I think provide just endlessly fantastic just perspective and experience. And I think as a manager that's got these teams, it, it's kind of the responsibility so that the, the older team members don't feel like they're on the wrong side of the, the age spectrum, that they can share that expertise and those learnings in a way that's constructive, that the younger team members can learn from. And I think like if you're able to successfully create that continuum where those learnings that have been honed over years are successfully communicated and passed down, like what an amazing transfer of knowledge. And so I think it's, it's almost like a blessing to have older team members because they have so much experience. And on the flip side, you have some Gen Z team members that are kind of like younger millennials, and they're, they've got different channels of communication. They approach things differently. They want to do different things. 
And so how do you bottle that up and not let kind of the legacy of what you've always done prevent you from exploring certain things? Like TikTok's a great example. Like we need to get on TikTok. And it's like, but is our audience still then? Well, yes, people are searching for all kinds of things on TikTok. So get on TikTok. But we have a little bit of like, you know, so that's where it's like we have to be open to ideas from from everywhere. And I think if you've established back to culture, um, a team and an organization where that open flow of ideas is embraced. And, you know, it, it's, it's something that everyone has not kind of like blinders on, but is willing to think that, hey, you know, there's there's some merit to all these different concepts. And that's our job as managers to kind of filter them down and figure out what we want to do. Then I think that's that's a winning formula. But I don't think you necessarily need to say, like, I'm going to treat my baby boomers like this. I'm going to treat, yeah. like, my weird Gen Xers like this. Like, yeah, I think it's... Exhausting. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to make it understand. I just, I think it's terminology. Like, yeah, opening, opening it up, you know, opening it up and, like, having trust that, like, hey, we're all, we're all one team here. And I think that that's, that's, what, that's what takes you from having, like, a disconnected remote workforce to a group that, even if they're far apart, feels a little bit more interconnected. Awesome. It's really powerful. I mean, just like to recap real quick, like focus, focus during times like these um, on what's really going to drive the KPIs and business goals that you set forth. And of course, they need to be revenue generating. I think all of us can be like clear on that during hard times. It's hard to go after the things that are like just money not to spend, like, you yeah. know, um, and then you said uh, trust. And I, that word really sticks out for me mm-hmm. because we were, we really believe in that trust factor with what we do and in cre- how do you create trust in a remote workplace, I think is something really challenging, um, but very possible. And so mm-hmm. you're doing seemingly really great job at this in building trust. So, um, and I think some of it, Zach, is just like being like authentic. Right. You know, and just like being you, and I've always gotten that vibe. So thank you for that. Um, we we do have one more question, and then unless we'll yeah, any, I could go with a million different ways. Well, let's minute. keep with our questions. And again, so I'm that trying we, to make sure that I don't talk about you know, two hours later, Zach. Yeah, like, we're dude. I'm ready. We, I got to go listen to some Grateful Dead. <laughs> <laughs> so Emma asks. Um, how to encourage stubborn companies to go for remote work, especially if they don't think that's effective for sales and marketing? Yeah, it's it's the age old question. You know, I think that, you know, it's going to be hard to convince everyone. But what I would say is that there's a war for talent out there. Right. And it is hard to find good people. And it, like the interviewing process, you know, there's a lot of people that have been laid off recently. But in the interviewing process, you know, it's it's tricky. And so I'd say if you're unwilling to embrace a remote workforce, then you are you're saying to the business that we're not interested in bringing in the best talent because we do have the tools and the technology at this point to support remote work. Uh, We know that organizations have been more productive throughout the pandemic and where we are now than previously based on how we've allowed people to uh, prevent them from having to do terrible commutes and things like that and giving them some more creative time. So I'd say it's really a question about what do we want to be as a business, right? Do we want to be a place that is a magnet for uh, the best talent so that we can deliver the best outcomes? Or are we going to take more of a closed-minded approach because we think that, you know, only local folks are going to be able to get the job done? It's, it's not either or, but I think if you're not asking that question and how you want to grow as a business and how human capital plays into that conversation, then you're really missing the mark. Ooh, I love human capital. I mean, there's a lot of big names out there recently and they're like, oh, well, I'll do whatever I want. And I mean, look at this shakeup that's actually happening, not thinking about the the human beings, right? And the people that are actually, you know, in this world. I mean, I think the more that we do this, you know, as as businesses, as companies, as humans, we will continue to be able to shift and change because there's so much going out there in this world where everyone's just thinking about themselves and we have to be able to take into consideration each and every person out there and what's going on and be able to actually have a more growth mindset look and opportunity and i mean like this is the beautiful thing that i love about you know zach with some of the tools that you know not only the information you're sharing with us but some of the tools that you can use that we have available to us i mean like if someone in your company and like not everyone feels comfortable jumping on camera speaking up but they might be amazing at what they do 
like we see it as we're doing right now. Like I'm, I, we have questions coming in. We have polls we are being able to do. The way that we can use and leverage technology, we can give each and every single person that feeling of voice at the company, just like how people take in information, right? Some people read the book, others wait for the audio, then we got The Last of Us that, you know, wait for the movie to come out, right? I mean, like we all consume information differently. And that's the same way as companies, we can give everyone a voice, just understanding the tools that are out there and being allowed, because that's all we want, right? It used to be everyone wanted to be seen, right? I think we've shifted into a world now where people want to be heard, however that might be. And I mean, it's, it's beautiful, all the things that you're saying and resonates so well with Rachel. Well said, honey. We have one more question from Caroline that came in. Has the business audience been oversubscribed to simple webinars? What does Blue Jeans remote workers and audience do other interactive activities that are not just webinar or video meeting focus? I think she's putting you on the hot seat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so look, there's, there's all different types of creative things, uh, I think. And you know, one of the things that's clear is that death by PowerPoint type webinars don't cut it anymore, right? If you're expecting that an audience is gonna come to watch you go through 20 slides and you're gonna create engagement, people are gonna be super pumped about coming to your next webinar, I think those days are past, right? And so I think there still is an opportunity. The conversation we're having today, this dialogue, I think that is maybe more closely to what people think about for a podcast or just some conversation. You know, I think that's more in line with the type of, of, of content that folks are interested in. I think there's certainly an opportunity to have more like product-centric webinars and technical webinars. And I think it's about having a mix. And then I think there's also this new category of experiences where it's not just a, a moment in time type of webinar, where you have kind of a collection of content that resides in a, in a hub that individuals can come back and revisit. And so as a content creator, you're not banking on the fact that at just this moment, at this day, at this time, someone's gonna engage with my content. You can actually go out and create a very dynamic experience that has multiple different types of webinars and videos, and you can host live sessions. And I think where we're, we're gonna see the future go is more of this community activation right, where you're building a content hub and repository where your community can come and participate and engage with one another. And so I think that's, you know, well said. Thank you, Zach, well said, what a segue. <laughs> so I think that's where we're going. I mean, really, really well said. That's what he's talking about, guys. That is we, don't, we, don't, we don't say this lately, you know, but we, we are business owners. We work with business professionals and we're content creators and we have a community our family and we are doing exactly what you're talking about zach you know right. we're a small business right um and let's be honest with each other many of times small businesses are the most agile and most creative right because we don't have the enterprise sort of behemoth behind us and i could say that with these working big, on both you know sides. working yeah. on both sides and you know we're doing that right we do we have programs and resources on demand content but then we come live, right? We come live just for the people in inside of our community, or we'll be guests on podcasts individually. So I think you're a hundred thousand percent correct here that it's it's about all of it. It's about the mix of content to deliver exactly what you said, yeah. Which is that people want to be seen and heard, and in many different sensories possible and they also want the in-person now too zach right yeah, yeah sure like that's happening like events are back what you know people want to meet us in person so it's important that josh and i are out in the community too well, like um, even when we had you know we had some writers of ours in another city but they were together it was like we're like okay hey why don't you guys meet up for lunch we're gonna pay for the lunch just so you guys can go even though they don't they're not in the same office they're working individually remotely but just doing things like that, right? Like, hey, we can't make it down there, but hey, pick a place, go to lunch. You guys connect and build that community instead of just being on the phone all the time. And like little things like that matter in this world. Don't be together. <laughs> this has been such a powerful conversation, Zach. Um, we're just great questions to everyone that's hung out with us. Uh, we're just really appreciative, Josh and I. If you, if this is your first time, I saw that many people are new. Please connect with Josh and I. We have a new experience 
coming out um, where we're going to actually help you become the standout authority you're meant to be. So do reach out to this and make sure you check out Blue Jeans. You know, we're really pumped by the capabilities um, and we have used, mul we do use every tool because we tried it all. We tried it all. We really love using, um, especially the studio capability, the chat, the polls. Um, it's been really, really great for, for our business as a small business. So thank you. Please check it out. You know, check out Blue Jean Studio. Say hello to Zach on LinkedIn. Yeah, please make sure you share. Like again, we're going to be share. going through, find another information. This is the thing, like what we talked about all the time educate your audience, inspire your audience, don't sell your audience. So like take the information that we've shared today and share it with the world because again, that's the way they're gonna draw on other human beings, be able to start those conversations, build the relationship that create opportunity. So Zach, man, thank you so much. We appreciate your time today, my friend. And you know, we look forward to seeing you. you on know, the next one. On the next one. The next thing. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for joining. Bye y'all. Um,